You know, I, uh, I'm, I'm tempted to just sort of ask what you uh, uh, personally define sustainability to be, because, um, and I'm not going to do that now, but I will do that later uh, when we have our questions and answers. But I, I worry that this is this idea has become so overused as to um, be losing its it, the sense of urgency that we should have with this this subject of sustainability. I mean, I, not too long ago, I was listening to um, uh, comments from a um, leader in a of a guest drilling companies saying that, you know, they were pursuing sustainability by using fracking to remove shale gas to make a more sustainable uh, energy uh, America. And I thought, well, if, if that kind of use of the term of sustainability is, is now in vogue, then uh, we're really losing sight of, of what this concept should be about. So I know that's the subject of the day, but my first concern is, have we devalued it and made it all things to all people so that, that this con important concept of sustainability is, is wearing thin? I don't know. Because when I came here to talk about my Hampshire journey, nobody was talking about sustainability uh, as an issue. If you were concerned about the planet, about nature, about the environment, you were you were probably concerned about the business end of tailpipes and smokestacks and, and chainsaws and, and, and putting out fires, basically, uh, fires in the environment that um, uh, were, were happening with disastrous uh, speed. Um, the idea of, that we should be thinking about how to go about the business of living so that, you know, when we're done, the next generation still has something to work with, that wasn't really the primary concern. It was, you know, what are we going to do about this uh, national forest that's been put on the auction block? So the other thing about this time when I, uh, I first arrived at Hampshire was a very different moment. Um, people are calling it the golden age of environmentalism now. Um, what it really was was the golden age of environmental legislation. You had um, an organization called the Environmental Protection Agency that was brand new then, and it had been uh, signed into law by a, a, a Republican president by the name of Richard Nixon. He had signed another bill called the Endangered Species Act. It's probably the most powerful um, legal protection for wildlife and wild places ever uh, adopted by any country anywhere in the world. It was voted into being unanimously by the U.S. Senate and with only five dissenting votes in the House of Representatives, the biggest piece of environmental legislation in history, um, completely bipartisan. Uh, it empowered any citizen in the U.S. to have standing to intervene in any uh, project that could uh, cause harm to an endangered species. You don't jump through legal loopholes. You Everyone in this room has the power to affect change through this piece of legislation. Now, in subsequent years, it's, it's been termed a, a job killer, a, it was regulation run wild. But at the time it came into existence, Richard Nixon didn't just sign it, he celebrated it. He said, ah, we finally come of age. We are, we are stewards of our, our, our great national legacy and we're growing up as a nation. And here, this Endangered Species Act is, is evidence of it. Can you imagine that? America compared to where we're at now? Of course, such a law couldn't possibly come into existence now, but to have done so unanimously, to mind-boggling. We took it for granted at the time because, you know, I don't know whether Richard Nixon believed that this marked the, 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 an evolution in, in uh, um, uh, America's maturity, but the politics of the moment demanded that he say that. And I just think about that time. What, a go what It was a golden age, I guess it really was. Um, I started saying that in a facetious way, but it was. Um, now, if we had taken that moment and that, cons that moment of consensus and said, ah, now the project we have before us is this, this great idea, sustainability. We're going to hold the line. We're going to make sure that, at the very least, the next generation has the same resources and opportunities that we enjoy today, at the very least. And hopefully we can do better than that. But that's the worst thing we can uh, um, the worst, the, the worst case scenario is we're going to hold the line. But that wasn't what we were talking about. We started talking about something else, this regulatory model that has come to be despised by, by, by some and, and viewed as ineffective by others because it became about 
how much of this particular pollutant are we going to allow? How many rat hairs is it okay to have in your Fig Newtons or whatever? You know, how, how, how many cancers per million people are acceptable because of the emissions from this power plant or additive to our food? When the battle becomes about that kind of regulation, nobody's going to get passionate about you know, saying, yes, X number of rat hairs in my Fig Newtons are okay. That's not going to light anybody's fire. Um, and the consensus of that moment turned into this battle after battle over uh, establishing a floor to how much we could poison ourselves. And, and that, that moment of consensus went away. And we, you know, 40 years of that kind of environmental regulation hasn't cured the problems that we're facing now on the environment. It hasn't made us more sustainable. We are far less sustainable today than we were when I walked onto this campus in the 1970s for the first time. That's scary. I'll give you one, one measure of, of how we're less sustainable. I'll go back to 1960. We now personally, you, if you're an average person, make twice as much trash as your counterpart in 1960 does. You roll out to the curb twice as much. I don't know what we're getting out of that, but uh, it's not because we're personally more prosperous or more fulfilled. I don't think. Um, we're just a lot trashier now, I guess. Um, I, I had kind of an epiphany about this uh, personally, uh, working on a book that uh, Charlene just mentioned. Called, it's called Force of Nature. And um, it is about Walmart, but it's also about this fellow I met who, who helped me uh, understand these things and helped Walmart understand some of these ideas. Uh, his name's Jib Ellison. He's a river guide. He's the most un Walmartish guy you're, you can imagine. He, uh, he lived half his life sleeping by the banks of wild rivers, leading expeditions, first descents of, of, of all sorts of rapids around the world. Very accomplished at it. Right now he lives off the grid uh, up in um, Sonoma County, California. In fact, when he first met the CEO of Walmart, he mentioned that they, that, that lived off the grid. And that almost ended his career uh, working with Walmart then and there because he, you live where? What? <laughs> Um, but he was brought in to partner with the CEO of the biggest retail company in the world, Walmart, not known for its good works or its social consciousness. Um, and, and his job became to turn the company into a kind of laboratory to test the business case for sustainability the business case for it, not, you know, because we want to save the planet or we want to be do-gooders, but because it's a sound business decision to be more sustainable. That was his proposal. That, that was what he suggested to the man who was then running the company, Lee Scott. And, and Scott's response was, in essence, well, prove it. And that's what they set out to do. Now, how do you prove to a bottom line business that being more sustainable, that doing things that are actually more planet friendly uh, how, do you, how do you prove that proposition that's going to be good for his business when he has he knows that environmental environmental stuff has always been about putting a burden on his company about obeying some regulation about not doing something they really want to do uh, how do you convince him that that's the wrong way to look at it he, they settled on a little project as much as anything that Walmart does could be little had to do with a, a toy truck toy trucks come in cardboard boxes and the idea was well is that box bigger than it needs to be? It was. The package was bigger than it needed to be. So they shaved a couple inches off of it. Now, what happens when Walmart that you know buys things in the millions um, and ships them from China, what happens when they shave a couple inches off a package? Well, a substantial portion of a forest isn't cut down. 500 containers, those giant shipping containers, don't have to be shipped uh, you know, 10,000 miles to get to warehouses in this country. Uh, about a million gallons of uh, fuel are not expended in transporting those toys. And the company saves, uh, I think it was about $2.5 million from taking a couple inches off the box in such a way that you wouldn't even notice it if you went to shop for it. You wouldn't notice the difference. And if you don't think Walmart cares about two and a half million bucks because it's such a big company, they'd have to sell $60 million worth of those toy trucks to make that much money in profit. So they, they cared very deeply about this. And 
What do you think the reaction was? Hey, this sustainability stuff isn't so bad. Let's try something else. And the idea literally caught fire in, in this big old company. And they started looking at how can we make our trucks more efficient? How can we make our stores less energy intensive? Hey, let's put skylights in our stores. We have fluorescent lighting in our stores 24-7. Let's put windows in. You know, I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't rocket science. It was common sense. But they needed an outsider. This is kind of the role Hampshire plays. Hampshire students often play. They needed an outsider to come in and say, why, aren't you, why are you doing it this way? Why, why aren't you being uh, m more aware of how much resources and energy and money you're wasting? Because waste is money. You're supposed to be in a, the masters of efficiency, Walmart. Why are you wasting so much material and money? And that, that simple switch in thinking powered a, a, a very real um, reconsideration of how this company does business. Now, uh, you, you know, every, uh, the reaction I get when they see a subtitle on a book that says Force of Nature, Walmart's unlikely green revolution is a subtitle, you know, people's eyebrows go up and they say, well, Walmart is not a sustainable company. No, no way. It's unsustainable. It ships, as we know. Enormous amounts of products, enormous distances, uh, and tries to persuade all of us to buy more and more of them, uh, those products uh, at unsustainable rates. So the business model is never going to be green in any sense. But what, what this river guide succeeded in doing is take this idea of sustainability and drag it from the fringes into the center of business concerns. Because when a company like Walmart says, we want to be more sustainable. What they're really saying is to 100,000 suppliers who sell them products, we want you to be more sustainable. And what they're also saying is we think there's a competitive advantage to be had by being more sustainable. And so all its competitors also either out of fear or out of a desire to beat their rival, whatever the motivation is, they begin to adopt the same practices as well. Um, and that's, that's the big story. That's the revolutionary part. Not that uh, Walmart is now praiseworthy, but that because they have made the calculation that they can profit from doing things that ultimately are going to be better for our planet than what we've been doing in the past. I mean, this is the reddest of red state companies, and they have been advocating putting a price on carbon. They actually, uh, at one point, were testifying in Washington in favor of climate legislation. Not Al Gore, right, who, by the way, got a standing ovation when he did a private screening of in an inconvenient truth at Walmart headquarters, if you can believe that. They didn't vote for him, but they gave him an ovation for his, for his movie. And, uh, and, and, and they do it not because, again, not out of altruism, because, and not because regulations are requiring them to do it, because neither of those models have saved us so far, but because, uh, and, I, and I'll never forget this, that this is how their head of their uh, greenhouse gas emissions division or department, or you know, I'm not even sure what he, his title is, head of their energy use, you know, he just writes a simple equation up. He says carbon equals energy equals money. Why wouldn't we want to cut our carbon? It, I don't care if you think climate change is the biggest hoax in, ever perpetrated on the American people. Reducing our carbon footprint just makes economic sense. And you're stupid if you don't try and do it. And you're not going to do business with us as suppliers if you don't do it. And that has had a profound effect. It hasn't fixed things. It has, but you know, the Titanic is steering a little bit away from the iceberg. Or maybe, maybe I should say it's melting the iceberg a little less now. It's a change in thinking that 40 years of regulation wasn't able to affect. And if you don't think that's meaningful, uh, and I, the Environmental Defense Fund has partnered with Walmart with its factory suppliers in China and have, I think they've done about 120 factories now. They've gone on in and done energy audits, and they've reduced their energy footprints and their carbon footprints 20 to 30 percent per factory in China, working with China and the, the Chinese government and the Chinese business, the factories are ecstatic over this. And of course, the environmental benefits are enormous. So that change, I think, is a cause for optimism. Um, now, 
when I finished working on that book, I had a realization that the real key to what attracted Walmart to sustainability and that really led to the biggest savings uh, in terms of impact on the planet and their own bottom line had revolved around waste, uh, 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 wasted energy, uh, waste we send to the landfill, food waste. Um, at the heart of all our most unsustainable practices is waste. And that became the subject of a, of a, a new book I, I was working on. It's called Garbology, Our Dirty Love Affair with Trash. Um, uh, because we do have a love affair with trash, it turns out. We're, we're kind of addicted to, to waste. We have an economic model that's based on waste. That's, that was the, the second epiphany I had working, working on this, this story about the CEO and the river guy. And I think this is an important thing because it's so big, we don't see it. I mean, you ever, anybody hear of these, um, there's a couple shows, Hoarders and Extreme Hoarders on, uh, anybody ever watch this show? The people who accumulate massive amounts of stuff and trash in their houses and just can't bear to part with it. I, I looked at one, of the, one, one couple in uh, the Chicago area who had to be dug out of their place and they were found, you know, dying of thirst and starvation because they had become trapped by all the stuff in their house. And I did a little sort of back of the envelope calculation about all this amazing amounts of, of trash that they accumulated and how long it took them to accumulate it. And uh, I think it was, I want to say there was about four to five tons that they brought out. And, and over the time period that it accumulated, these extremely abnormal hoarders had generated exactly the same amount of waste that the average American generates. There was nothing abnormal about their stuff, other than the fact that they couldn't bear to part with it. You know, all the rest of us roll it to the curb and get it sent to the landfill, but we're, we, we generate just as much trash as they do. Uh, we just hide it better. And that was kind of shocking to me. So, you know, I wanted to find out how much waste do we generate and exactly how uh, big a problem it is. And if you go to the Environmental Protection Agency, they have a kind of trash Bible, how much trash we make and so many pounds a day. I think it's like four and a half pounds a day the average American makes in terms of waste. And we recycle a third of that and it's really not so bad. All those numbers are just fictitious. <laughs> this is very disheartening. The, uh, the, the real numbers are about twice as much trash as, as the EPA does because they don't actually measure the trash. They do this materials flow analysis and they find out how much stuff is manufactured and then they figure out what's the life expectancy of everything that's manufactured in the U.S. and how much of that is thrown out in a year. And they started doing this in the 1960s because there were so many dumps and nobody knew how much was being thrown away. They had to come up with some methodology for figuring out our trash. Meanwhile, the entire landscape of trash has changed. We have all these commercial landfills and city landfills where everything that's brought to them is weighed because that's how they make money. And some folks at Columbia University had the idea, why don't we find out how much <laughs> trash is actually being thrown away instead of this crazy Byzantine method that the EPA uses? And so they did, and they produced a report that shows we're actually making twice as much waste as we thought. And we're recycling much less of it because the numbers are just magical thinking at work that the EPA uses. So things, in a sense, are much worse than we thought. But the upside of that is the waste that we are generating is kind of a, a voluntary thing. It's the one big social problem that pretty much anybody can do something about. And as you know, Walmart has demonstrated, you actually make money if you... Uh, if you reduce your waste, it's it, it's kind of a no-brainer again. Now, why are we why are Americans so wasteful? That was the other question I uh, wanted to explore in this this new project. And I'm there's another moment in history that I think is important to consider. Um, Thirty-five years before that golden age uh, uh, for environmental legislation, there was the immediate aftermath of World War II. And two big things happened then that I think are important. One was the GI Bill. And it wasn't just a, uh, you know, a nice thing to do for veterans. It was giving 
something to an entire generation because one in eight Americans actually served in World War II. It was a huge cohort of people. And all of them were entitled to a basically a free ride to any college. They were entitled to buy a house at rates that made it cheaper than renting an apartment. And so you had this social engineering on a massive scale happening uh, after the war that created the middle class that didn't really exist in a recognizable form before World War II and afterwards became a sizable section of the population. Um, a better educated one. Suddenly you have a middle class with an expectation that their children should get to go to college too. Uh, and suddenly you have a world in which a Hampshire college can even exist that might not have had without this uh, this uh, um, amazing one-time set of benefits that was given to one generation. It was a prosperity engine. At the same time, you have the creation of the consumer culture. And this, this is a great moment. 1947, the father of corporate branding and modern marketing. Um, this is the guy who uh, the government hired when they uh, launched the Polaris submarine because it was so cramped, um, uh, sailors were, were going stir crazy inside. And he said, we want you to redesign the interiors to trick our sailors into thinking it's more spacious. And he did. He did it. He was hired by an airline that was having trouble because its airliners were so uh, noisy. I think it was Eastern Airlines. And uh, he, he came up with the idea of renaming the fleet the Whisper Jets. No. He was the master of making you believe the opposite of reality. He's the, the father of modern branding and marketing, J. Gordon Lippincott. And he said in 1947, okay, the war is over, America's ascendant, we have all this prosperity, we have all this industrial capacity, and we don't know what the hell to do with it. Our first message has to be America is a land of abundance that can never be exhausted. We are living in an economy of abundance. That was rule one. That's our first message. The second message was we need to convince people that they need things that they don't know they need. We have to manufacture need so they can buy things that this industrial capacity can make. And the third thing is, and I'll just quote, quote him directly because it's, it's amazing, because he wanted to convince people to throw away their stuff so they could buy new stuff. And he said, our willingness to part with something before it is completely worn out is a phenomenon noticeable in no other society in history. It must be nurtured, even though it runs contrary to one of the oldest inbred laws of humanity, the law of thrift. Now think about that. Here you have an America that had been trained by about two decades of depression and war not to waste anything. As a matter of life and death, wasting was was verboten because we were that close to Armageddon, economic and military. And he said, now we have to retrain America to throw away perfectly good stuff uh, and, and buy new stuff because our resources can never run out. I mean, that was, that, was, that was the magical thinking that became the basis of our consumer economy because this, these were the marching orders that really became built into our new consumer economy. Waste is good. And if you believe that, then you have, you don't just have an economy that's built on waste, you have an economy that's, and society that's addicted to waste. That's why it's our dirty love affair with trash. We, we love trash because it has made us what we, we are today. And, you know, I don't know if we have any psychology people in this room, but the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual says magical thinking is actually a, a personality disorder. I think we're all, in some, to some extent, suffering from it. I, you know, just the other day, the, the, the President uh, Obama was speaking about this, this hypothetical 100-year supply of clean natural gas uh, that um, we can extract in order to become energy d independent or to, to, to push us in that direction with a br big bridge to energy independence. And it's, it's, it's all magical thinking. That gas each time you drill a well and it you have to use 8 million gallons of water to extract that deep gas in our uh, layers of shale. It's incredibly dirty. It's incredibly costly. And in fact, the prices are so low for it now, it has to be exported at great environmental and, and uh, economic cost to other countries. So there's no energy independence to be found in it either since we're going to be selling it elsewhere. 
And I should also say that, you know, this idea that natural gas uh, is a bridge to this energy nirvana future, they were saying that back, <laughs> back in that golden age I was telling you about when, you know, I was attending Hampshire College and I could walk across to Prescott Tavern and get a beer because the drinking age was 18. That was a, that bridge to the energy future in 1975 was exactly the same bridge they're talking about today and still hasn't gotten us there. So magical thinking, an economy of abundance and, and, and consumption that's based on fostering waste is our recipe for unsustainability. Uh, it's why waste has put us in a position where the average American now, in their lifetime, will create 102 tons of trash. And a country where the amount of plastic, disposable plastic we manufacture outweighs the U.S. Navy. <laughs> um, where waste is so omnipresent in your home, did you know that most cable TV boxes are now, which you can't shut off, uh, use more energy than your refrigerator, just doing nothing? I mean, it's waste. Uh, waste of food is, uh, you know, has been the subject of uh, several excellent books. Twenty-five percent or more of our food supply ends up in the trash. Uh, it's so omnipresent that it's uh, it's almost invisible. You know, we, this illusion that we roll our trash out to the curb and it disappears. There's a mountain in uh, Los Angeles County, not far from where I live. It's Garbage Mountain. It's, it's, now, it's the uh, largest municipal uh, landfill in the country now. It's 500 feet high. It used to be a valley <laughs> when they started it. And there were three peaks about 500 feet high with um, a cow pasture in the middle, a large valley. Um, it was a high point in Los Angeles. It's where the Nike missiles were in, uh, placed to shoot down Russian bombers during the Cold War because it was the high point over Los Angeles. The whole middle of that has been filled up with trash. It's now almost full. Um, I took a tour of it, and we were standing on top of it, and the, and the guy in charge says, you're standing on 500 foot of trash. Isn't it awesome? You know, it was like that scene in um, Apocalypse Now. You know, you love the smell of uh, jet fuel in the morning or uh, napalm in the morning. A mountain of waste. I mean, we're building those all over the place. I, uh, uh, the other thing that blew me away about our waste is trash is now our number one export. Did you know that? If you look at the number of containers we ship overseas, uh, scrap metal and scrap paper are our, our biggest exports. That's what people want, not our computers. It's, uh, it's our biggest export to China. You know, we have gone from, in 1947, the country that makes things to we're sort of serving as China's trash compactor right now. It's just a little, a little sad, but that's uh, what happens when you have an economy built on waste. So I, this was an interesting project to work on because that's all very grim. But as I, I think I mentioned a little bit ago, I, and I want to emphasize this, it's the one thing we can actually do something about. I, I hung out with um, the trash artists of San Francisco. It, it, San Francisco is a great place. They have um, three artists in residence at their dump. They actually pay them to be artists in residence, and, and, and it's a highly competitive job. And, and so I hung out with these artists, and, and it, invariably when they arrive there, the rules are they can, they can do whatever they want, but they can only use stuff that people throw away to make their art. They have sculptors, painters, uh, musicians. A guy made an entire orchestra out of trash, and, and, the, and the San Francisco Symphony performed, his, uh, performed it. It was actually kind of cool. Uh, I had a puppet maker. Uh, this one artist I, I got to know, she was, uh, she, she um, m makes fabric and sewn art of r real objects that she found in the trash and she does sewn versions of them. It's actually, it's, it's, they're really quite beautiful. Um, but she was worried when she got there, how am I going to sew? I can only use stuff that people throw away. I need needles. I need thread. And one of the old hands said, if you need it, it's going to come, seriously. It will get thrown away. And within a week, there was two beautiful sewing boxes, you know, these big sewing kits from seamstresses filled with 
needles and thread and everything that you could possibly need to make her art. Not one, but two. She, she, she had an abundance. Um, and, uh, and of course, it, she realized what had happened. Somebody had died and all their treasure became trash and was thrown away. But it was perfectly good stuff. And the waste that com comes through this, this dump in, in San Francisco is filled with useful material, with treasure, not with trash. And that's why, the art, that's why San Francisco pays uh, to have these artists there, because their work is a demonstration of how foolhardy we are in the things that we choose to view as waste and how, how easily uh, that value can be recaptured. Um, so there's, the point of that story and the story that I think is important is that there's a way back from, from our wasteful ways, that that 102 tons we're on track to make isn't necessarily an inevitability. It's kind of a, a choice. Um, another little oddity. You know, landfills are sources of methane. Rotting things make methane gas. It's actually worse in terms of the impact on the climate to, to bury stuff in the ground as we do than it is to burn it and make power out of it. Actually, in terms of climate emissions, it's actually worse for us. Popular wisdom would say otherwise. You know, we send about 69% of our stuff that we throw away to these landfills where we bury them. There's countries that have 1% rates going to landfills. They, they recycle and they uh, repurpose and just throw away less. You know, the average Japanese person throws away half of what the average American does. And they have live in a highly industrial, uh, uh, prosperous society. Uh, how is it that they can make so much less trash than us? I, I, I find that an interesting question. I met the guy who, ever hear of Chico bags? It's a kind of uh, reusable bag. He says plastic bags are the gateway drug to waste. He says if we could just start with getting rid of the disposable bag, it puts us on a path of discovery of all the things we can do without. He, he's, he's an interesting guy. He created this creature called Bag Monster. He took 500 disposable plastic bags and made a suit out of it. And he kind of looks like this giant like, puffball of, of, of waste. And... Um, he goes around and, and, and speaks at schools and so forth about the you know, 500 bags is what the average person uses in a year. And it's like huge. Uh, he actually had two versions of the suit. The first one was sewn onto um, a graduation gown. <laughs> and after he wore it a couple of times, he does a lot of antics in his bag monster outfit. Kind of got smelly, but he couldn't wash it. <laughs> so he had to get rid of bag monster. And, and bag monster uh, uh, version two 2.0 bag monster, as he calls it. Uh, he figured out he could put the bags on Velcro strips and uh, on a uh, on a, some kind of cloth leotard, and then take take off the strips when he's done and wash the leotard. So now he has hundreds of these bag monster outfits that he farms out to different people who borrow them and and use them for anti disposable bag activism. So go figure. Bagmonster.com if you want to see what it looks like. And um, but he. He has this great view on how to l try and reduce our waste. And he says, look, if you really look at the things you buy, you end up throwing them away in less than two years. And a lot of the stuff we buy ends up trash much faster than that. So when you go and you want to buy something, if you're thinking, ah, someday this is going to be an heirloom, or I'm going to want to have this around for a long time, then go ahead and buy it. And But if not, you know, if you if you aren't thinking of that in terms of you maybe we need to think that um, purchasing decision because the best strategy for not wasting things is not getting the stuff in the first place that you're going to throw away. I mean, trash is the only thing you have to pay for twice. You have to pay for it when you buy it and you have to pay for it when you, you know, pay to have it hauled away. That was Walmart's epiphany. They, they decided we're not going to throw stuff away anymore. We're going to take our old hangers and make dog beds out of it and take our slop from the food waste and make compost out of it and sell that to our customers for their gardens. And they ended up cutting their waste by 81% in all their stores in California where they experimented with this, which is kind of phenomenal. I mean, you think about a trash can this full, trash can this full. Um, that would be a challenge, I think, for most people to do. But I, I would say if Walmart can do it, maybe, uh, you know, just about anybody can. Uh, the other person I wanted to tell you about, one more example of the way back from waste that I, I, I ended up writing about, 
is this woman, B. Johnson. She said she wanted to reduce, she wanted to have a zero waste home. That would be her journey. She knew I can never be zero waste, but we're going to really try. And her husband was very reluctant to, to, to get on board with this. So um, he, did a, he did a little budget, and he figured out, well, if we stop buying this d disposable stuff and we use reusable this and we cut out certain things and we get a more fuel-efficient uh, vehicle and we drive less and we do all these things, he figured out they could cut their household expenses 40% and go on vacations and, and do some things that they were deferring because they didn't have the money to do it. And that sold it. You know, it was kind of the Walmart thing all over again, that it makes economic sense to do the thing that's also good for the planet and preserves and conserves resources. And I thought that was so cool that you had a very idealistic and a very a bottom line uh, uh, sides of, uh, of a, a married couple who arrived at the same place from completely different directions and said, yeah, this, this, this idea of trying to be zero waste, even though we can't do it uh, all the way, we can certainly go a long way to accomplishing it. Makes sense. All right, well, um, I think I will end my uh, prepared remarks, semi-prepared remarks at that point. And uh, if there are questions about any of these sustainability matters or anything else, I'll take it.